What is it that's shocking maybe that we find in there that we don't find in our Bible? Number one, the 10 words are different. Okay, the Ten Commandments. First of all, you everyone knows who studied, if you study religion in general, how do you count the Ten Commandments, right? They're supposed to be ten. They're called Asad and Hadevarim. They're supposed to be ten. How do you count them? The Catholics, the Jews, the Lutherans, everybody counts them different because they're trying to make ten and, and they just can't get there. This one is unique. Why? Because it doesn't match either, but it makes a lot more sense, and I'll build on that. Now that doesn't prove that Moses wrote it or that it's anything authentic, but could this be something which takes us closer in the development of the canonical text? Ross Nichols, welcome to Myth Vision. How you doing, my brother? Man, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Derek. Uh, no problem, no problem. I'm glad we're on this tour here in Israel. We're in a is Israelite fortress that has been co-opted by multiple civilizations over thousands of years. That's right, that's right. I mean, part of this is 8th century. Some have been dated to the 10th century. I mean, we're, we're sitting in an ancient place. Yeah. And what better to talk about than ancient stuff? So your book right here, just yep. so everybody knows, the Moses, Moses Scroll. Yep. Um, I hope that people will check out this material and give it a shot. Yeah. There's controversy around this whole scroll that is being discussed in this book. Absolutely. And you described in detail leading up in Neil's video of what is going on, the controversy around it. Moses Shapiro. Yep. I've interviewed academics that kind of, eh, you know, eh, right. provenance, uh, you know, he was known to have sold forgeries or this or that. Yeah. And so I'm interested in getting into the material here. Okay. As right. you did with Neil, I'm okay. curious to know, in this text, you said there's something different about this than right. what we find in canonical Deuteronomy. Yep. In the sections that we would say, Moses, if we're just granting that this might be, let's call it, as you said, the most primitive Deuteronomy there is. All right, I got Even you. if Moses didn't yeah. write it, let's just say someone attributed it to a guy named Moses. Yeah, or an earlier text, right, yeah. An earlier text. Whatever your position is, and mm -hmm. I do that because some people are just not even able to... Sure, I get it. Hypothetically. Yeah. So, let's just say that is. What's different about this than the sections, you would say, this is found in the Bible itself that we read today in Deuteronomy? Yep. Okay, so excellent question. So, here, here's the idea. Whenever scholars look at the text critically, they find things that just jump off the page. We know that this is not reflective of something that's from antiquity. For instance, anachronism. You see anachronism all over the place. You see a place name that is supposed to be, it's, the text wants you to believe that it's written in the time of Moses, but it clearly can't be because it uses a place name or it uses language that is clearly written at a later period. A contemporary writer would not have written that. So, so when we read the Bible, and once you see it, once you see it, Derek, you can't unsee it. So people will see things that are written in the text that say, like, for instance, I, I'll give you an example. In Genesis 12, for instance, where it talks about the Canaanites were then in the land. Well, that implies that this is written by a person later at a period when the Canaanites were no longer in the land. Well, the children of Israel hadn't even gone into the land at this well, point, but... supposedly, <laughs> right? So how can the Can... Of course they're not in the land because whoever's writing this. Here's another example. When Moses, de when it describes in Deuteronomy 34, that Moses died and he was buried and all this stuff. Okay, you read this text and it says, there's never arisen a prophet greater than Moses. Now, if Moses just died, right? And some, let's say Moses dies right here, Derek. We see mm -hmm. him, oh man, he died. And then somebody goes, hmm, never been a prophet like Moses. You're like, he just died. Give it a minute, right? Right. So this is, it's someone is writing at a much later time. Now, if that's written 200, 300, 400, 500 years later, then you go, now we're talking, see? But the anachronisms or the things that clue us in, that the, none of that is in the text. Now, most scholars have identified, you know, when you talk about the documentary hypothesis, you talk about source criticism, most scholars will look at the text of the Pentateuch and they'll begin to see, okay, this is priestly, this is P, this is E, this is J, this is D. 
All right, we're talking primarily about D when we're talking about this particular text, uh, which is something we can get into. But what is interestingly absent from this text is material that has been identified by scholars today, not in the 19th century so much, but particularly today, as being priestly, which is later, mm-hmm. right? Well, none of that's here. Another. So, okay, so to, just ahead. to point yeah. out your yeah. prediction here, and yeah. you know, when you're doing science, you yeah. have to have a testable hypothesis exactly. that you predict. Yeah. And and what you're trying to suggest is that Shapiro, when yeah. he when he is pointing out that this is a discovered scroll yeah. that may go earlier to a form of Deuteronomy that is primitive compared to our canonical one, is that he, there's no way he had omniscience yeah. to know that this material didn't match what later academics all across the board, yeah. supplementary hypothesis, yeah. documentary hypothesis, yeah. all of them nail that to the wall and say, ah, you know, this is Priestly, and this doesn't fit that category. He's a bad dude. Let me tell you this. If, if it's a forgery, it is absolutely the most groundbreaking piece of literature that predicted, as you said, not only what scholars are just now learning. Now, let me, let me be honest. Let's be fully disclosed here. He did know something of critical scholarship because he read Friedrich Bleek. But I read Friedrich, Friedrich Bleek because I wanted to see, let's say, I, look, I want to know. If it's a forgery, I'm going to write a book about the best forgery ever. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do it. Look, brother, I don't, I, hey, I want the truth. So I get, when I get into this, I started looking at this. What, what is absent from this document, if you were following the top scholars of the 19th century, he would have faked it a different way. And then here's the other thing. Listen to this, Derek. If I'm going to fake it, here's what I wouldn't come up with. Now, you've heard this. I know you've interviewed people, and you've done some research on this, too. You and I have had a discussion. So one of the things that they say is Shapiro was involved in some fake stuff from the land of Moab. So if I'm, I'm sorry to say Moab, which is actually, but if, if I'm going to, if let's say I did do some fake stuff from Moab, if I'm going to do something else fake, and this one I'm really going to rake in the bank, the last place I'm going to tell you it came from is Moab, because I don't want anybody to go, oh, hell, it's Shapiro talking about Moab again. We know what he did with the last thing. So you wouldn't, in fact, Herman Goethe says this in his work on fragments of a leather manuscript. I, I published that in English too. But I wanted to know what is it that really kind of seals this for me. And when I began to study some of the top scholars, you've interviewed some of these scholars on the Dead Sea Scrolls, he couldn't have known that scrolls written on leather would not only use paleo, we have, remember we have 13 manuscripts from Qumran, this is in Emmanuel Tove's work, that's, that were discovered written in paleo. I'm not talking about just using the divine name in paleo, I'm talking about the text of a document. 13, all of them are ascribed to Moses, right? So, and all of them employ, not all of them, let me correct myself, most of them employ what are called interpunks in the text, meaning between the words, they, the words are divided with interpunks. Now, the interesting thing about that is, in the Shapira document, well, let's call it the Shapira manuscripts, interpunks are not used between every word, but only in certain places. Now, where are they? In the ten words. This will blow your mind. Oh, it blew my mind. Let me put it that way. Might not blow your mind. But in the ten words, which are different than the canonical text, Different than Exodus, different than Deuteronomy, all right? It uses them between every word. Now, I I mentioned when I talked to Neil on his episode that uh, we know this from lapidary. In other words, anything written in stone, the interpunks are used. The Moabite Stella, the Siloam inscription. But they had no evidence of anything like this written on papyrus or leather or anything like that. But here we have a document and the one part of the manuscript that employs interpunks between every word is in the Ten Commandments. Now why is that? Because the Ten Commandments were written on stone. So it's like the writer of this document, whether it's Moses or whoever, is trying to show us Hmm. that this is what the Ten Commandments would look like. 
Now, if, if somebody's a fundamentalist like me who's dabbling a little bit, you know, I, I want to be a believer and I want to be someone who's critical at the same time. I'm thinking, let's say that this thing really is ancient. Let's say that someone is, he wants to include it in his scroll and he goes, and he writes dot, word, dot, word, dot, because he's representing what the 10 words were. So there are all these, there are things that make you say, hmm. So again, if this is a fake, as many scholars, ancient and modern, believe, then, you know, the guy not only predicted 80 years ahead of time, written on leather, written, on pa written in paleo, used inner punks as you would expect them to, coded the document in, in what we thought. They thought when it was discovered, I can tell you in a later episode what it really is, but they thought it was an asphalt type coating. Then they put uh, a linen wrapping around it. Well, that's exactly what we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, how do you know that? Mm. Like, if you're a forger, you got you also have to be like a palm reader or some kind. Right. Like, it's not a century. It's a century later that we actually over a century later that they discover all this stuff. Yeah. Let me ask you this, <clears throat> just so our audience understands, we can go into endless people who think it's a forgery. Yeah. But f to be fair, there are real, actual academics, serious credentialed academics who are part of the mainstream. Yeah. Who think this is serious and yeah. think this is actually a legit document right. that is not a forgery. Can yep. you give us a few names on that? I can give you I can give you a few names and I also know some names that I can't give you because I'm going to let them come out. The the most prominent, the most prominent is Edon Dershowitz. So, when my book came out 2 weeks later, I had no idea. I didn't know Edon. I know him very well now. I have the greatest respect for him and not just because he's interested in Shapira because he's a brilliant scholar. But the thing about Edan is Edan's book came out two weeks after my book. Now he's got all the attention, right? Because he's a PhD, he's a Harvard fellow, and, and, and it came out with a lot of fanfare. It hit the New York Times front page. Well, this set off a just a bomb. It was like dropped in the middle. And so scholars, Christopher Olson's one of the first one who responds. I, you know, I, I think all these guys are great. Uh, Matthew Rochelle responds. All these other scholars are saying they don't agree. So I'll give you one example. Dr. Tabor and I work together on the research. I mean, now he's a New Testament scholar, and he says that every time he talks about the Shapiro case. He says, yeah, it's not really my field, but technically he's a biblical scholar. So he, he's big into this. Now, we go to the airport, one example. We're flying to do research, James and I. No tour this time. We end up at Ben Gurion at the same time. He calls me out of breath. He's at the passport section you guys went through. And he says, hey, man, guess who I just ran into? I said, who? He goes, Charlesworth. Mm. I said, J James Charlesworth's here? He goes, yeah, man, he, we're talking right here in line. He said, wait until we get out. So they come out, and, and Professor Charlesworth, you know, says, hey, man, you realize this thing is authentic, don't you? Now, some might say, well, you know, that's a pretty big plug. So, and and... Dr. Charlesworth wrote a letter to several of his colleagues and said, hey, you got to get this, talking about my book, you got to get the book. So, but there are other people, let me just say for the record, uh, that I know of that are, let's call them Shapira maniacs, or uh, they're interested in the case of Shapira, and they might lean more favorably to it that I can't name, mm -hmm. uh, but I can tell you that uh, Dr. Shimon Gibson is a good friend of ours, and I'm not going to testify as to whether or not he agrees it's authentic, but what he does say is it deserves a second look. And that's you know? what I think we need to ultimately yeah. aim for, whatever your conclusion is, is, is we need to take in a, a serious look into this. And there's a tragedy here yeah. um, that if, if he wasn't a yeah. forger, you know, I, I hope we hurt some feelings here, meaning I hope the sensitivity hits that someone, it wasn't just like this guy was like, oh, uh, his life was ruined it because was of this. It was absolutely ruined. And he didn't want to live anymore. Yep. Yep. Uh, it hit him so hard. So let me ask you one more question okay. as we're getting into this, because I know we're going to have to do some follow-ups and we're going to have to dive into yep. the letters and everything. Yep. Um, I'd love to do that at some point. What would you say is theologically or textually in it that is radically different. We don't find in our own Bible that it teaches yep. that it's different than when I'm reading Deuteronomy. I'm just not going to find it in yep. this 
It's not, this is yeah. not going to show that. I got you. What is it that's shocking maybe that we find in there that we don't find in our Bible? The whole thing is shocking. Let me give you a couple of quick examples. Number one, the 10 words are different. Okay. The 10 commandments. First of all, you, everyone knows who studied, if you study religion in general, how do you count the 10 commandments? Right? They're supposed to be 10. They're called Asera Hadevarim. They're supposed to be 10. How do you count them? The Catholics, the Jews, the Lutherans, everybody counts them different because they're trying to make 10 and, and they just can't get there. And then you have Exodus and Deuteronomy don't agree. Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 don't agree. And then some scholars propose that Exodus chapter 34 is an ancient priestly version of the 10 words. Some propose that Leviticus 19 is a different. This one is unique. Why? because it doesn't match either, but it makes a lot more sense, and I'll build on that. So you have 10 words, and I'm not gonna tell people what they are right now, but the 10 commandments are different. Now you'll read in the sources that some people read and they go, yes, yeah, Shapiro's manuscript had 11 commandments. That's because those people, frankly, can't count. There are 10, but it was something that was misunderstood from the very beginning. Now Shapiro's manuscript and I'm calling it Shapira's, the one he brought forward, has one commandment in the 10. I'm using that terminology. It's people, what people are familiar with. One of the 10 words is this, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. And each of the commandments ends with this. It ends with, I am Elohim, your Elohim. So the first commandment, you read it, and it says, I am Elohim, your Elohim. And in the leather strips, every new commandment, first of all, you have... Uh, interpunks between every word, every new commandment begins a new line. It's easy to count them. You go one, two, three, four. You can hang it on your kitchen wall. It's easy to do. Now here's something else. Get this. Each commandment has a blessing and a curse affixed to it. Now a lot of people may not know this. Your audience might, but get this. If you look at Deuteronomy 27, Deuteronomy 27 says, you're going to go to Mount Ebal, you're going to go to, you're going to, go to uh, Gerizim. When you cross the land, you're going to set up stones, coat them in plaster, and you're going to do this ceremony. Read the blessings and the curse. And then in Deuteronomy 27, it gives you the curses. There's no blessings. What? There's no blessings? Most people don't even notice that. It's the writer of Deuteronomy has lost the blessings. They're gone. This document has them. Not only does it have them, every one of the 10 words, use the one I just don't hate your brother in your heart. There's a blessing. Blessed is the one who doesn't hate his brother in his heart. The curse is curse is the one who hates. Each of the commandments has an associated blessing and a curse. It has a ring of authenticity. Basically, this document has, I told Neil, this document has, there are seven things mentioned in the Pentateuch that Moses wrote. And Moses wrote this. One of the things is Deut in Numbers 33, it says, and Moses wrote a travel itinerary, basically. And then you have in the book of Numbers this long list of places that supposedly the children of Israel went. This manuscript begins with, and the Lord, and Elohim spoke, it doesn't use the name, but the divine name, by the way. It says, and Elohim spoke unto me, saying, you've been at this mountain long enough. And from that point on, it gives a slight, little short uh, travel itinerary. It's but first guess person. what? It's first person. And if you read Deuteronomy, you realize that the geography is confused. You have this ch the children of Israel going up, then they're down, then they're up, then they're down. This one has it all straight. I mean, it's amazing. So you could say, well, it was forged, and the forger knew that it was screwed up in Deuteronomy, so he fixes it in his manuscript. Had a lot of stuff to fix, mind you. I mentioned the divine name. The divine name, yod heh vav -He, which is mentioned 7,000 some odd times in the Hebrew Bible. If you just look at the Pentateuch, it's used hundreds and hundreds of times. But we have this interesting thing. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 2 and 3, according to the text, God is speaking to Moses, right? And he says, uh, by my name, yod heh vav -He, some say Yahweh, Yehovah, whatever, uh, I was not known. I was known to them as El, you know, El Should Shaddai, I? right? Well, what's interesting about this is that the divine name is not in the main body of this scroll. It only uses Elohim. So what is striking about this is the scholars who looked at it did find that somewhat appealing. 
because a lot of them had already begun to think the E material. The E material might be older. Right. So Shapira <clears throat> actually has this idea he's struggling with. He goes, could it be that I found an E, a manuscript that is associated with the Eloist? Right? Right. Could be. Now, that doesn't prove that Moses wrote it or that it's anything authentic, but could this be something which takes us closer in the development of the canonical text, right? So you do have an intro and an outro to the document, but it's nothing like you see in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy has five verses, and, and you know this. It says, these are the words that Moses spoke on the other side of the Jordan. Well, whoever wrote that, guess what? They're writing from... The promised land. They're right. writing from the land of Canaan. <laughs> when I, the first time I saw that, Derek, I was like, where have I been? Why didn't I notice that? Well, this, this document is written as if it is present. It, it's contemporary. It's the writer is there. So I already told you it's got basically a short, a shortened version of the travel itinerary. It's got the 10 words or a version of the 10 words. And then it has this blessing and curses thing. And that's about it. Now, what's interesting is it represented the fine 16 fragments of, of uh, leather, and you couldn't even read all of it, by the way. My transcription, Edan's transcription, uh, only has uh, probably about uh, two-thirds of the text because we had several columns that couldn't even be read. So you got two manuscripts, roughly 42 columns of text that were brought forward. Of that, that means that there are two manuscripts, identical for the most part, 21 columns apiece. Now this would equate to about the size of the book of Hosea. Let me give you one point. The children of Israel cross over and Joshua says, hey boys, you're going to have to write. God said, remember through Moses, we had to write a copy of this on the stones. Can you imagine the guy that has to write Genesis 1-1 through Deuteronomy 34-12? He's like, oh man, are y'all going to wait for me? Because this is going to take weeks. <laughs> Right? You know, it's gonna, you know how long it's going to be? But this document, somebody could write it. They could write it. Now, what I'd like to talk to you about later is a lot of people want to think that the, the scroll of Moses was never lost, but those people haven't read the text. I'm actually using the very text that a fundamentalist would use to find clues to what the authenticity of this thing might be or something like it. So in the days of Josiah, there's a manuscript that's found. And the manuscript, almost without exception, Derek, most scholars will say, now they might call it a pious fraud, as many people have. Mm -hmm. In other words, the prevailing view in academia is they didn't find a scroll in the days of they Josiah. Made a scroll. They made a scroll. And that's exactly what all the head-hitting yep. scholars that I interview say. They say Josiah created. Yep. Oh, we found it here in the temple. Yep. But really... Well, let me, let me give you one thing, and if you, if you can fit me in to talk about this later, here's what I think. Uh, this, is, this is my working hypothesis. I think all the scholars are right that a, uh, that a form of the book of Deuteronomy is what we're talking about in 2 Kings 22, 23, 2 Chronicles 34, 35, where it's dealing with this scroll of Moses that's found. Remember now, the Hebrew says... Hilkiah says, we have found the scroll of Mo. This is the one he wrote. That's the claim, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is almost every scholar says they're at least wanting us to believe it's Deuteronomy. Now, what I think that some scholars have come up with that fits my working hypothesis, let's say, just play it. Okay. Let's say that they really did find the scroll that Moses wrote. But maybe the academics are right that they also interpolated, they added other things, the law code that was very prevalent at the time. Make sure our priests are getting hooked up, the whole nine. Amen, brother. Now look, here's the other thing. The funny part about this is that once it's found, now remember, you're talking about Josiah. This happens in 622 BCE. We've got a pretty good accurate handle on that, 622 BCE. What I find striking is that from this point forward, once, once they find it, guess who is the prophet at the time? Well, at least one of the prophets at the time, according to what we have in the biblical text, is Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah is alive at this time. He says, he gives a couple of things. One of the things that he gives 
is that he says, when your scroll was found, I ate it. He oh. devours the scroll. He's referring to the discovery of a scroll in his day. Derek, let me tell you something else he says. Jeremiah says this, and it blows people away. They, they, fundamentalists hate this, or they don't read it. Jeremiah 7, 22 through 25, he says, this is supposedly quoting the word of the Lord. Go ahead and cook your sacrifices and eat your meat. For in the day that I brought you out of the land of Egypt, I never, con I never commanded your fathers concerning sacrifice and offering. But this is the command that I gave them. Obey my voice. So Jeremiah is standing in the temple and he's telling the priests that God never said anything about sacrifices and offering. Guess what this document lacks? Sacrifice and offering. Amen. Not only that, there's, there's one other thing. In Jeremiah 8, verse 8, Jeremiah says, Who are we to say that we are wise and the Torah of the Lord is with us when the lying pen of the scribes has made it a lie? Okay. Now, so, why? The, you know, th this is amazing because this tells me Bible fundamentalist Christians, fundamentalist whoever you are, they're not paying attention to the details like they should. Because this is what made me start to realize that I was, that that whole, the Bible's inerrant, infallible, everything about it. Like the Bible tells you itself yeah. that there are problems with the scribes who helped write the Bible. It I says mean, they lost it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not like you, I'm picking. Look, I just, love the biblical text. Just because we're running out of time. And yeah. I cannot tell you how much fun you are, by the way, from being on this tour. And I yeah. know Neil, Neil and me both, we've found a brother. And yeah. I mean that. If you could tell just two to three things, like why people should really get this book, obviously the things you've described so yeah. far are reasons, but what, what will they get out of it? Well, first of all, I think it is the most controversial case in all of biblical history. Like, I, I wouldn't waste my time. I'm a busy man. I've got a lot going on. I teach every Saturday. I've got, I'm leading tours. I felt compelled to write this book because I honestly felt, Derek, that this was an injustice done to this guy. You mentioned the tragedy in the end. I mean, he's discovered from the time he brings it to the European scholars until he's found dead in a hotel in, in the Netherlands is one year, man. Like, I fell in love with this guy. Like, I'm telling you, I felt like he had been wrong. If you ask any scholar, you go, hey, are you familiar with Shapiro? They go, Shapiro the forger? You know, I, I almost feel like if he's right, if he was wrongly accused, if he is wrongly called a forger, and by the way, I don't say in this book that it is authentic. I build a case. I put all the evidence together. I bring every, I read every newspaper article that I could find. I, there may have been some I missed, but I read everything I can find written in all the British newspapers during this time, and I incorporated it into a flowing narrative to crack it open. Reopening is what I call it, reopening the most controversial case in biblical history. Now, that's number one. Number two, and I think that it primarily ties to vindicating a great wrong. When I look at the Dead Sea Scroll, I'm a scroll guy. Man, when I, when I fell in love with the Bible as a kid and I grew up in fundamentalism, I know your story, a little bit of it, mm -hmm. you shared. Um, the thing that, I, it wasn't that I was just clinging on, hoping and praying that I could somehow salvage a bit of my faith, but I was really interested in what is the truth? How did it all start? Where did it stem from? And I would say the second reason, other than vindicating, at least presenting a case in his defense, mm -hmm is this idea that perhaps, perhaps the biblical writers left us clues. They knew, even if it was just in their memory, their collective memory or their individual memories, maybe there are enough clues that can give us hints as to what the original said. Because I do believe that you can somehow get back at some sort of a, an Ur uh, Torah, if you will. What was it that Moses wrote? And I lay out the case, and I think, you know, I cover things like uh, reasons for reevaluation. Again, you, you, can, you can create a forgery. We know in modern times, mm -hmm. the Museum of the Bible, they've been busted how many times? Now, that can happen. But what if this was one of those? Shapira has one quote, and I'll just tell you. I have to put on my glasses, but I just want to close with this one thing. The sin of believing in a false document 
is not much greater than disbelieving the truth. The tendency of showing great scholarship by detecting a forgery is rather great in our age. When Shapira's manuscript was called a forgery and everybody piled on him, he wrote this letter. He wrote it to the chief librarian that had the, the museum that had his manuscript while he went to the Netherlands. And what he's saying is something that I think is quite profound. What if, what if people have called this a forgery? You know, it's easy for the academics to say that's a forgery. That's easy. Mm -hmm. But what if it's true? Is the sin greater for believing that it's true or in declaring something that is true fake? Because if they're wrong, that man died and it's on somebody else's hands. And I'll tell you, Edan wants this and I want this. I want to put this man, if he's vindicated, when I find this scroll, Derek, I'm coming to you and Neil, I'm telling you, because here's the deal. I want to, Edan said it first, give credit where credit's due. He wants to rename a street in Jerusalem, Shapira Street. And I think he deserves that. And I think we're going to find it. And I believe it's going to be vindicated. Thank you. You're welcome, my brother. Ladies and gentlemen, join MythVision's Patreon not only to support us, but there are 72 videos that I did with Dr. Dennis R. McDonald and Richard Carrier, all on the Patreon, early access. You guys can ask personal questions when I go to interview these scholars, and you're helping MythVision grow. 